Okay, this morning I want to begin uh, what will probably turn out to be a series because it just doesn't seem like I can do anything other than series any, anymore. Um, for years I wondered why it was that, that the other pastors would never finish anything in one week and this is another one of those things that I've, I thought I could never do that. I had a hard time getting 15 minutes out and now I can just ramble forever, it seems. Um, I want to I look at, at a, a passage um, over in Ephesians, over in the book of Ephesians, which is a, a marvelous, a marvelous letter, especially when it comes to doctrine. There's so much in it that it took Elder Mott five years to, to get through it. Um, I won't take that long, and I'm only going to look at three verses, but it might take a couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I want to zero in this morning on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, where we read, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This is a, this passage has so much doctrine in it. Um, there's no way that I could cover everything if, if I had two years of Sundays. There's no way that I could cover everything in this passage. But there's a few things that I want us to notice. Number one, it says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I want you to notice something. This is very important. I want you to notice. Hath quickened. Has quickened. Something that is finished. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. We're going to hammer on that part just a little bit this morning. You hath he quickened. In, in uh, verse 4 and 5, which is just beyond what we said, we find out a little bit more about this. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Notice it is God that has done the quickening here, it wasn't you. You didn't quicken yourself. You did not bring yourself back to life. God did that when you were dead in sins. Not at the time when you ran down the altar to shake the preacher's hand and ask God to forgive you. By the time you ran down the aisle to shake the preacher's hand, it was too late, you were already quickened. There's not a human being on planet Earth that has ever believed in Jesus Christ that was not already a child of God. If you believe in Christ, it's because God has already quickened you. It's that simple, and that's, this verse makes that plain. Now, half quickened in the Greek is, in, is what we call the aorist aspect, or the perfective aspect. It's something that's a past completed action. Um, and to quicken means to reanimate. To reanimate. Um, this term, quicken together, we're, it's something that is someone that 
has lost the animation of life that has been reanimated. Now, we can spend a week talking about how it was that we lost that animation of life, but I can give it to you really quickly. Adam in the Garden of Eden. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he killed the entire human race. And the entire human race from that point forward was born dead. Now, they weren't born spirit or physically dead, of course. Adam lived for 900 and something years after that. So he didn't drop dead immediately upon sinning, but he dropped dead spiritually. And I want you to look at something. This isn't in my notes, but I, let's turn to it anyway. It's over in Genesis chapter 5. Um, we have so many people, and you will hear it over and over and over and over again, talking about how we are created in the image of God. You know that's, that's not true? Adam was created in the image of God, but we weren't. We weren't in, created in the image of God. In, in Genesis chapter 5, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he him them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness. Not in the likeness of God. His son was created in Adam's likeness. Well what happened between the time God created Adam and this son was born? Adam died. He died spiritually in the Garden of Eden. And so the likeness in which the son of Adam was born, and every son of Adam since, son and daughter for that matter of fact, every one of them has been born dead spiritually as a result of that. And so you were born dead. And if Paul is telling these Ephesians that God hath quickened you. In other words, he's taken something that was born dead and brought it back to life again. Now, if you were born dead, how long do you think it would take to talk to somebody that's dead to get them to accept something so that they could come to life? If I were able to give you the word, a dead person, the words to come back to life, and I went to the morgue today, how long do you think I'd have to preach to the people laying on the slabs before they would accept that and come back to life? I'd be there a long time. I'd probably miss church next week if I just kept doing it, right? It would be a gigantic waste of time. You cannot bring something back to life by talking to it. If you were dead in trespasses and sins, you were just as dead as a corpse in the cemetery. And there's nothing you can do about it unless God gets involved and reanimates you and quickens you. And that's what Paul is saying that God did. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Over in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 15, you don't need to turn here, it's a minor point, but um, we'll do some flipping here in a second. But I want you to, th this, this talks about the, uh, about the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son that had decided that he was go going to take his inheritance um, and he did. He took his inheritance and went off and, and wasted it and, uh, with, with riotous living and, and came to the point where he was, um, well, he came to the conclusion that he'd be better off as a servant in his father's house than he w would be living out there by himself. He'd be better off if he was a slave in his own dad's house. And so he went back to become a servant in his father's house. And his father said over in Luke chapter 15, 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. When did he become alive again? Did he become alive again? I mean, is this not saying that he was already alive again? If it says he is alive, then he is alive. This is the same verb tense that we're talking about when we talk about hath quickened, is alive. He is already alive. If you have been quickened, you are already alive. And that's what, what we're talking about. Look at, uh, look at Colossians, a couple of pages over the right. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. 
where we read, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is the work that God put within you that gives you the ability to do anything relative to him. In fact, look at, look at, uh, look at verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, is, as ye have always obeyed, not um, as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you. God put that work within you, and that's the way that you can then respond to it. The only way you're going to respond to something relative to God is number one, you have to be alive. Number two, God had to work something in you so that you're able to work, work that out, to, to do something with it. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. I'm sorry, I was in the wrong book. Well, no wonder that was an odd verse. Let's try the real Colossians 2.13. That's better. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your, is, is this right? Flesh, hath he quickened together with him. You know, we were talking last, just before church started. Chad was talking about the fear of standing up here and doing something wrong. See, Chad, it happens to all of us. <laughs> And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses? Hath he quickened, finished, done, finalized? God has done it. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of that's past. That is good news, is it not? which is what the gospel means. Is that not good news to know that if you're a child of God, it's forgotten. It's past. It's over with. All of that stuff is behind you. And God took care of it. And if God took care of it, it's done. You don't have to carry it around with you anymore. Um, look also at, at, uh, at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Hath reconciled. Past completed action. Already finished. Not predicated on something that you do. Because again, if you're dead in trespasses and sins, what can a corpse do? Other than rot. That's about it. It's about all a corpse can do. So we're being told that God has quickened us and that that's a past completed action. Now I want you to notice back over in Ephesians, this passage begins with the little word and, which links it to the thoughts of the end of chapter one. And is a conjunction. It's used to connect these, these two passages. And remember, you know, I mean, it seems odd sometimes you look at the Bible and you wonder, well, why did they break it up here? Well, it, the, the numbers in your Bible, that's not inspired. The Bible was written as a letter, and, and very few of us sit down to write a letter to somebody and, and start off chapter 1, 1, and start writing, and then 2. We don't usually do that. These were added in centuries later so that it would make it easy, easier for us to be able to find things within the Bible. But for centuries, this was all written like a paragraph. It was written just like a letter. Um, the verses came much later. So wherever they broke them up, they broke them up and we've been dealing with that ever since. But this passage begins with the word and, which links it to what came before. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23 to get the context of what this and is referring to. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, 
And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, and you hath he quickened. Do you see how that ties together? So that when it says that you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, it's referring to he did the same thing with you, the same power that changed you from being dead in trespasses and sins was the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. This is not something that's a maybe. This is something that is fulfilled. Chapter 1 closed out with Christ having been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. And chapter 2 is going to show that that same work, the same work, that was worked in Christ to raise him is the same work that's wrought in your body as the church. And the power that was set forth at the end of chapter 1 is shown in chapter 2 to be extended from heaven to fallen sinners in this earth to raise them out of a death and sins to sit with Christ in heavenly places. Now you may not be sitting there right now in, in flesh form, you will be someday. But remember that when God does things to him it's done. When God wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, it was a foregone conclusion that someday you'd be in heaven with him. It's that simple. God's not bounded by time. So he knew from the beginning, from before the beginning, he knew when Christ would come to pay for the, he knew what was going to, he still knows what, he knows everything that you will do from the day that you're born until you die and has known it forever. He already knows it. So he's not bounded by time as we are. Now, who is it that did the quickening? It was God Almighty. The Almighty God that created all that is who did the quickening. To quicken means to give or restore life to, to make alive, to vivify or revive, to animate. And the he is the same he that we find in Ephesians 1.20, where it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So the he of you hath he quickened is the same he that raised Christ from the dead. And I want you to notice that Paul uses the second person plural here. You. And you hath he quickened. To specify to these Ephesians that they're the ones that God had quickened. How would you like that? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a letter to the Lakeland Church from the Apostle Paul that said, And you hath he quickened? You know, I've, I've longed, I, I, I wished for years that my parents had have named me Rufus because there's a passage in the scripture that says where, where Paul salutes Rufus chosen in the Lord. And that would, have been, that would have been nice if my name was in here. It's not. I have to base things off of other evidences because, well, my name's in here, but it's not in that sense. Um, but um, anyway, okay. <laughs> I just got that look. Um, so now, I want you to consider this though. The, he spoke directly to the Ephesians, but he also spoke to you. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus. Now watch this and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. If you are one of the faithful in Christ Jesus, this epistle was written to you. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, that famous passage that 
so many seem to misunderstand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The world under consideration there, unfortunately, people seem to misunderstand it, and they, they tend to think that that particular world includes the entire human race. When you look at John chapter 17, and you look at the different ways that the word world is used, you can see that it's used in a number of different senses. It can, the word world can be used to refer to the planet Earth, to society, to those for whom Christ did not pray, for those to whom he did pray. Time, so which world are we talking about in John 3.16? Clearly we're talking about the world of the elect. And God so loved the world of the elect that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was writ that was written to you, whosoever. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this passage was written to you saying that you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Over in John chapter 5 and verse 24, we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, that's present tense, that's you sitting here right now hearing what's being spoken. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me. So if you're sitting here right now believing in Christ who was sent by God and believing in God and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Hath, that's present tense. You're in possession of everlasting life. If you hear and believe you are in possession of everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. You have passed from death unto life. You were born again before you heard and believed. The new birth comes first. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. We have, we have someone that might be born even as we are here this morning. Now, as far as I know, he's not born yet, but eventually we're going to get a phone call that's going to say that he is born. Well, when we get the phone call that says he is born, is he here yet? Has the doctor spanked him on the bottom? Is he already a child that's born? Of course. And it's the same in 1 John 5, 1. Is born. Once you're born, you're born. The believing is in the present tense. The being born is in the past. And so this is written to all of the faithful in Christ Jesus. And it's teaching the doctrine that if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then he has quickened you. And that's the point. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now the death which out of, from which you have been made alive, we've, we've, I've talked about this already, is a spiritual death. A death in trespasses and sins. Matthew Henry said this. He said, The miserable condition of the Ephesians by nature is here in part described. Uh, observed, one, unregenerate souls are dead in trespasses and sins. All those who are, in, who are in their sins are dead in sins, yea, in trespasses and sins, which may signify all sorts of sins, habitual and actual sins of heart and of life, Sin is the death of the soul. Wherever that prevails, there is a privation of all spiritual life. Sinners are dead in state, being destitute of the principles and powers of spiritual life, and cut off from God, the fountain of life, and they are dead in law as a condemned malefactor is said to be a dead man. You've heard of, you, you probably remember that movie, Dead Man Walking. It was already determined that he was dead even though he hadn't been killed yet. People that are in sins, those that have not been quickened, those who are dead to sins, this is one of the things that a lot of people have a hard time under grasping. This, we talk about the doctrine of total depravity. A lot of people have a hard time understanding that those that are dead in sins don't care. 
They simply don't care. The sins that they commit, they don't care. They run from one to another. They're fine with it. The only time that it would bother them is if they get caught and it might make them look bad. But aside from that, they just simply don't care. It's only children of God that have that guilt within them that troubles them, that bothers them, that makes them feel like they need absolution in some sense. And so if you, when you sin, suffer as a result of it, if you are like David, when he fell on his face after the sin with Bathsheba and said that the sacrifices of, of, of God are a broken in a, let me, let me get to it. I don't want to misquote this, it's too important. Psalms chapter 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. For those that, that are hurt by the fact that they sin, for those that suffer with their sins, for those that that are troubled, but truly troubled, not just because you look bad in front of your friends, but because you look bad in front of God when nobody else even knows about it. If it bothers you when nobody knows about it, that's an evidence that you are one of God's children because if you're not, it wouldn't bother you. It simply wouldn't bother you. And so that's why you can look at things that go on in the world and you can look at some of the actions of people that live in the world and when you scratch your head and wonder how in the world could somebody ever do something like that? They don't care. It doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother them to lie to your face. They don't care unless they get caught. It doesn't bother them to do any of that kind. It just doesn't bother them. The only people it bothers are God's children. So if it bothers you, if your sins grieve you, that is an evidence that you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? Now a trespass, you know what a trespass is. You put up a sign on your property that says no trespassing, no hunting, and somebody comes along with their shotgun and climbs over the fence, what are they doing? They're trespassing. They've gone past the boundary of where they were supposed to go. That's a trespass. A sin is um, a transgression of a law. We're, we're told over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, that that's exactly what it is. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. If there is a law and you transgress that law, you have committed a sin. God gives you a law. He says, don't steal. You steal, you have sinned. Very simple. Um, now there are places where there is no law. And we're told in Romans chapter 4 and verse 15, where no law is, there's no transgression. Unfortunately, we have a lot of churches out here that come up with a whole bunch of their own laws that aren't written in God's scripture anywhere. And so they make up their own laws and they're called the traditions of the elders and they live by that. And that was one of the things that Christ was fine, or constantly arguing with the Pharisees about because they'd given more weight to their own tradition than they did to the word of God and made the word of God a none effect as a result of their traditions. If there is no transgress, if there is no law, there is no transgression. Don't beat yourself up over something that some human told you that was wrong. If you you can't find it in this book. That's simple. Now to transgress a law of God, that's, to, that's violating God's authority. If God tells you not to do something and you do it, then you've violated his authority, have you not? This is, this is something that, that, that I, I have to deal with from time to time, especially when it comes to counseling people, and that is that and let this sink down. Over in uh, 1 John, 
and again this isn't in my notes so Wendy needs her rabbit for today because I'm going all over the place um, and of course I don't have it marked I'm sure I'll, some, Carl will help me out here in a minute. There's a, we are told that if we confess our sins, there, was that it? Yes. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to for forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there are people that will beat themselves up for years over something that they, some, some sin they committed 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And they've confessed it before God and they just continue to beat themselves up over it. You realize that you, you are sinning by doing that? God says, God, this Bible says that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess them before him. If you confess your sin before God and you believe this Bible, then God has forgiven you of it. Get over it and do better next time. But don't beat yourself up over confessed sin. God is faithful and just to forgive it. So don't you hold a grudge, and don't you think that he isn't. If you've confessed it, it's done. Now, don't do it again. And I don't know how many people will go through life and just beat themselves up constantly over something and keep confessing the same sin over and over and over again. God forgives it immediately. He understands that we're but dust. And that was included in part of the you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, being trespassers and being sinners, we are outside of the circle of God's will expressed by his commandments. And understand that while you are a trespasser, while you are a sinner, now we're, don't take this wrong because we're all sinners and we're all going to always be sinners. But those that, but the ones I'm referring to right now are those that have not been quickened. Prior to being quickened, when you're one of those trespassers, one of those sinners, you're outside of fellowship. You're outside of any, you, there's no way that you can get to the, the, no way in the world that you can get to God, to fellowship with God. Once you're quickened, there's a pathway. But prior to that, you, there's no way. You, you can't gain fellowship with God if you're lost. So how then could you ever possibly be saved? You know, under Moses' law, there, there were both sin offerings and there were trespass offerings. There were offerings for both of them, and all of those offerings pointed to the sacrifice that was made by Jesus Christ. Turn over to Ephes or, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 8. We'll begin with verses 3, verse 3, Hebrews 8. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts, and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. You see, all of those sacrifices that went on, all of those laws relative to the sacrament, the trespass and the sin offerings that were given in the Levitical law pointed to the day that Christ would come and we were, and they, and Moses was told to make all things according to the pattern in the mount when God gave him the instructions, which is a shadow of what actually goes on in heaven. When Christ was crucified and then rose and stood before God and, and, 
and presented himself as the sacrifice, that was the fulfillment of all of those 1,500 years of slaying lambs and pouring blood on stuff. All of that was fulfilled in that one act. And the, what went on down here was a picture of what was going to someday happen there. Okay? That, all those Levitical laws relative to sin and trespass offerings were fulfilled when Christ did that. Um, look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, in almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You see, the lambs were just there to point to the day that Christ would be, would be the Lamb of God and would, and would take take the rest of that away. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14, we read, For by one offering, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. So there is no offering that you can make for your sins. That's already been made. And it was made by one so much better than you. Jesus Christ took upon himself all of the sins that you've ever committed, all of the sins that you will ever commit, and not only that, he took upon him the nature of sin, the, the broken part of you that was inherited from Adam, and he took all of that away, every bit of it. That's what the sacrifice, and in doing so, when God comes along and quickens you, that's all erased. It's gone. So, why do we sit around and complain? Why do we, you know, it's interesting that many times we're somewhat, I don't know why, I don't know how to, I don't know the word that I'm looking for. We're, we're somewhat subdued in our presentation to the gospel of our friends. I don't know if it's because we're afraid they're going to reject us. I don't know if it's because. I don't know what it is, because what we have is so much better than what the rest of the world has. What we have is a finished thing. It's something that we don't have to worry about. You know what? You don't have to run down. We don't have to sit here and sing just as I am every week and have people run down the aisle and fall down on their knees and ask for forgiveness. We don't, we don't have to do that over and over and over and over again. I don't have to spend 90% of my sermon trying to get you people saved eternally. I don't have to, I can actually teach you something other than go through the same thing week after week after miserable week and just try to get you down the aisle. Right? We have something that is, that grants us freedom. We have, the way the Bible says it, rest. We have rest. We are able to rest from this constant working to try to get saved. And that's what the gospel is, and that's what it means when God says, and you hath he quickened. You're already made alive. And because Christ has died for those trespasses and those sins, we who were dead in trespasses and sins are quickened out of that death. We're made alive out of that death by the work of, by the work of Christ. And so the announcement of Ephesians 2.1, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, is the effect of the atonement of Christ. That's what brought it about. These Ephesians, just like all of mankind that comes out of Adam, were dead. Dead means, literally, 
and in the senses directly connected one that has ceased to live deprived of life in that state in which the vital functions and powers have come to an end and are incapable of being restored when you are made alive from something that was dead understand what dead means it doesn't mean just kind of unconscious it doesn't mean well you know what I could be I could do something on my own no you're dead and it's evident from verses 2 and 3 that describe the lives of those that are dead in trespasses and sins that it's that particular type of death notice let's look back at, at, at verses 2 and 3 and see where we were in times past now I made the statement a little bit earlier that people don't seem they just don't care Let's see what the scripture says. Wherein in time past, chapter 2 and verse 2 of Ephesians, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Think about that. Think of life in this world as being a racetrack. Like a Grand Prix racetrack. And there's a course that you have to follow in that racetrack. And you go around and around and around on this course and you follow what everybody else is doing on in 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 the world you do the same thing you make the same patterns you follow all the same thing trying to get to the front of the line okay you walk according to the course of this world that's what people do out there in the world they walk according to the course of the world whatever the world's doing that's what they do they follow it according to the prince of the power of the air because he's the one that's 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 in control of the course of this world the prince of the power of the air that's the devil and so you're following the course that was set out by him for you to follow that's what you do before you're quickened the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience you see that these Ephesians before they understood the gospel were still walking in the course of this world even though they'd been quick and they were still walking in the course of this world because they didn't know any better and that's why he was talking about in, in chapter 1 about the eyes of their uh, of the this, their eyes of the revelation being enlightened so that they could understand so that they can understand what they should do among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others that describes these Ephesians before they came to the understanding that they had been quickened. That describes every one of us before we came to the understanding that we had been quickened. That describes the entire world that's out there today, does it not? You look around at people, are they not just following the course of this world? Is that just not what they do? Whatever the world says is important, that's what, that's what they rush to. And if this week it's the Kardashian family, then they run to the Kardashian family and they want to be like them. And next week, if it's something else, they'll want to be like that. They follow the course of the world, patterned out by the spirit of the power of the air. The devil's in control of all this stuff. He won it when he, when he ended up sending, sending Adam into, and the rest of us into hell. So that's what these Ephesians were doing, the same very, the very same thing. Um, they were, now, these people were very much physically alive, right? So the death is not a, I mean, they, these Ephes they're very much physically alive. People out there are very much physically alive. So he's not quickening them from that death. He's quickening them from spiritual death. And when you are spiritually dead, Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says that we're without strength. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And if you're dead, yeah, you're pretty much without strength. So this spiritual death in trespasses and sins is that death that man died in the day that Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. When God said that in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, that's the death that was died, that, 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 that came upon him. And, and physical death and the second death are result of that same, of that same transgression. 
Now, verses 2 and 3 give us a description of the times past of those who are dead in trespasses and sins. It's a description of these Ephesians before they were quickened or before they had knowledge that they were quickened. You may, if your experience is anything at all like mine was, there came a point in your life when things that you used to do that you thought were perfectly fine all of a sudden didn't feel perfectly fine anymore. Not because you'd talk to anybody, not because you went to church, not because any, you just, it just didn't feel right anymore. There's, something's wrong here. This used to be perfectly fun. Now all of a sudden it just doesn't feel right anymore. Well, that's the point at which God says, stop it. You've been quickened. And then lo and behold, what happens? You start looking for the reasons that it doesn't fit anymore. And the next thing you know, you end up in a church. And then some preacher tells you to come down the aisle. And then all of a sudden he says you're saved when you came. No, you were saved before you ever walked in the door of the church. It was God's action of quickening you that brought you to that church to begin with. So this gives a description of not only them, but it also gives a description of us in times past. Now, I want you to notice there's a change here. In verse 2, I've got to get back to my text. In verse 2, it says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of, of disobedience. He's using the, um, the second person plural, you here, or ye in this case. So he's talking about the Ephesians when they were dead in, in trespasses and sins. Now look at verse 3, because there's a change. It says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. You see, this is not just the Ephesians. This is everybody. We all did this. And if you look back at it honestly, you can see yourself in this as well. We all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now I want you to see what happens in verse 4. Because here you are just traveling along on the course of this world, living the way that you want to live, thinking everything is just hunky-dory until verse 4 rolls around where it says, But God, who was rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. What did you do to have anything to do with that other than you were there and God did the work? So now let us examine ourselves in the light of these verses to see if we passed from death into life. Do these verses describe the way you are or do they describe the way you were? Do you still walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience? Do you still live that way? Among whom all, also we all had our conversation, do you still have conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind? Are you still like the children of disobedience even as others? Or were you? Do you want to know if you're a child of God or not? Which one describes you? Is this present tense with you or is it past? That's what we'll tell you. That's what we'll tell you. That phrase, wherein ye walk, declares that in times past, when they were spiritually dead, they walked in trespasses and sins. Walk means to journey, to move about, especially on foot, to go from place to place, also um, 
I mean, to go on one's way. You just walk through this. Trespasses and sins, in other words, form a pathway in which they, they, they walk. They basically walk from one to another. You just walk from one sin to another sin to another sin to another trespass to another sin to another trespass. Does that describe you now? Does it describe your past? In Romans chapter 6 and verse 19, We read that, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Understand that even a child of God, even a child of God can walk according to the course of this world. And in doing so, they have yielded themselves to be servants of the devil. And so what Paul is trying to tell these Ephesians is that you have been quickened. Clean up your act. You see, the call from the, the, call from the pulpit is not to get you eternally saved. The call from the pulpit take those children that are already eternally saved, the ones that God has already quickened, and try to make, get them to live better in this life, to live a better life to God, so that they can reap the benefits of living a better life to God. That's the purpose of a minister. It's not my job to populate heaven. It's my job to try to help those that are down here that God's already chosen to get along in this, in this life a little bit better and to tell you not to walk according to the course of, the, of, of this world and not to follow the prince of the power of the air because you can do it. A child of God can do it. Now, he'll be punished for it and many times People will drift into a sin, and the next thing you know, they get punished for it. If they're supposed to know better, and they don't confess it, and they don't repent of it, and they do something, there's a good chance they're going to get whacked. And if they do, then maybe the next time they'll, they'll learn. That's how God deals with his children. Now, these Ephesians prior to this, in Romans chapter 8, we're, we're told that they were told partially why. We're talking about those that are not walking according to the law of God. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, it says, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Consider this for just a second. If you allow yourself to drift back into the flesh, and, and we've, we've, we have seen this, how many, how many brothers have we excluded in the four now? I think four or five? The people that have drifted right back into the flesh again, people that have just gone right, and, and if you if you talk to them now, you will see that they've regressed even farther than they were before they ever joined the church. I remember Conrad used to always tell me that, that when somebody starts to turn away and drift into the flesh, God gives them a stupid pill. He just turns the lights out and you go run into these people and you'll find they drift so much farther away. Once you start to drift, if you don't grab a hold of something and get back, that's where you head. That's the way you head. If you start allowing yourself to listen to the devil, and because and, he's, he's pretty subtle. He was in the Garden of Eden he was very subtle, and if you allow him to slip that stuff into your head and start to drift into that direction, 
hang on. This is this is one of the biggest fears. I've, I've talked to Elder Wagner in in Minnesota about this. We both of us are scared to death that this is something. This could happen to anybody. We've seen it happen to people. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to us. It can happen to me. It can happen to him. And it's and it's a frightening thing to see how you can take somebody and shut their lights off. Somebody that and it doesn't matter. We have examples of people that were that were great servants for, for Christ that, that are responsible for starting churches all over the world. I'm not going to mention the doctor's name, but most of you know who I'm talking about. And what happens? They drift. And pretty soon their lights are shut out. And all that work that they did, all, all of that that they accomplished, while the churches may, still may be here, they're not here anymore. And that's a great fear, not only for us, but it's a fear that we have for you. That it doesn't take much. The devil is really good at tricking people into, into walking off. And that's why sometimes we end up with churches that are as small as they are. And why it is that sometimes people tend to go away. Because they forget the fact that they've been quickened and they start to look at the course of this world and they take their eyes off of God and they start putting their eyes on themselves and the minute you start thinking about yourself more than you start thinking about the sacrifice that was made for yourself you are in danger of walking according to the course of this world even if you're one of God's children so that's what we that's why we spend our time up here pounding on the pulpit for this because it can happen to all it can happen to any of us and when that goes on you are not then in God's way whether you're a child of God or not there comes a time when you can drift away to the point to where you're you are completely and totally out of the will of God in Psalm chapter 119 and verse 130, David says this, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. If you do not choose that way, and you begin to drift then there may not be any coming back and it's a very unfortunate thing to, to watch happen remember from our early lessons over in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 I want you to understand something because this is applicable to everyone In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it you realize you're still stuck with that you still have that flesh nature as long as you live in this world you're gonna have that flesh nature and you're gonna have to war against it the rest of your life and if you don't then you might drift and that's why we spend so much time up here saying what we say sometimes. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. We read, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was the reason that Christ went to the cross. Every one of us has turned away. We, now we did it as a result of, sin, of, the Adam, of the sin of Adam, but you know what? We would have done it anyway. Before we start thinking that Adam screwed up, let's remember that Adam was fresh from the hand of God. Adam was so much more intelligent than we are. We've digressed since then. And he couldn't keep it. He could not keep a simple commandment. Could not keep one simple commandment think about that and all he had to do was not do anything God didn't tell him I want you to go mow the grass God said don't do anything and he went and did something
Turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Just to make this point, I, 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 the point being that, and, and, I've, and I've been working around this thing for a long time here, um, I've made the statement earlier that, that those that have not been quickened don't come to God that if you have finally showed up in a church is because God's already led you in there and once he's led you in there it's too late to try to get saved you're already a child of God I've tried to make that point I want you to think of exactly what it was what was it that Adam and Eve did after they sinned in the Garden of Eden did they go to God did they look for him in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 we're told and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God Lord God amongst the trees of the garden they hid from him and that's why people that walk according to the course of this world generally aren't going to be found in one of these rooms and so I ask you again, I want you, to, I want you to take a look at yourself and I want you to look at, those, at, at the words that are written in verses 2 and 3 of Ephesians chapter 2 and ask yourself, is this present tense for me or is it past? Is this what I'm doing now or is this what I used to do? And if it's something that you used to do, then consider that it might be something that you used to do because you have been quickened. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. For this morning, I'm going to stop right here. We'll pick this back up again next week, Lord willing. Um, but for now, we're, we're running right up on an hour, so it's about time to close up for this morning. So with that, let's stand and sing number... Let me find my notes. number 37 and we'll be dismissed in prayer